بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته our respected viewers we welcome you to another edition of our series on Western education prohibition or obligation these are a series of videos where we discuss refutation and response to arguments of the proponents of the ideology of Boko Haram. Uh, I am Ibrahim Mohamed Bello from the Awa Institute and with me today to discuss this episode is Professor Aisha Habib from Yusuf Metamasule University Kano. Assalamu alaikum Prof. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, to discuss the topic with her is uh, Amir Abdullah Hilamidu. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the key arguments of those who prohibited conventional Western education is that they teach riba and they promote the learning of interest based banking system. Now, for that reason, they said since Islam prohibits dealing in interest. Any study that will teach that, okay, or promote that is equally prohibited. Uh, Hajiya, briefly, what are the main reservations Muslims really have in reality regarding conventional banking system? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah once again. I, say, I think basically there are three major issues which uh, Muslims are not comfortable with and I think which are prohibited in Islam as far as conventional banking is concerned. And I think these are categorically stated in the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first one is the issue of riba, uh, which may be simple or compound depending of explanations from um, scholars. And uh, we see that there are so many verses in the Quran categorically stating that riba is prohibited in Islam. And uh, secondly, I think, is the issue of garar. Uh, garar, even though it's not directly stated in the Quran, but scholars are of the view that there are verses that are indirectly relating to garar. And uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty that is uh, not knowing the consequences of something or probably the consequences of something being hidden yeah. uh, I think uh, some of the verses that are propounded by some scholars believing that these verses are referring to Garar one of them is I think um, so they believe that this th that is the Mufassirun uh, tried to explain this relating it to Garar. Yeah. And then the third one is the Maisir. And that also has categorically been stated in the Quran that it is haram, it is Gambling. forbidden. Gambling. So I think these are the three main where Allah says there are some, at least two verses which come to my, which, which come to my mind that actually prohibited this gambling. Yes. That you should not come even near to it. So I think these are the major things that Muslims frown at when they are talking about this conventional economic uh, banking and other institutions relating to economics as far as the uh, Muslims are concerned. All right. So... In other words, in reality, oh. Muslims have reservation for conventional banking yeah. system. Because of because these three. Because of this uh, win-lose type of thing, that only one side takes the risk. The yeah. higher risk is borne by the debtor, right? Yeah. Why the creditor is at no risk at all or low risk. And there's also this issue of uncertainty, which also relate to gambling and a number of verses. Now, let's, let's still build on that. The Quran and Sunnah clearly prohibit this, like Haji uh, Professor have explained. Now, but then, is it permissible for a Muslim then to study this topic, economics, banking and finance, and all these religious subjects where these principles are taught and even promoted? 
Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Uh, I think there are some important points to be made here. One, there is no doubt regarding the fact that conventional economics and conventional banking is based on riba and it also involves uh, gambling in some situations. It also engages in, you know, uh, a, a, a excessive speculation and uncertainty. And also, in addition to all this, there are also specifically and clearly prohibited transactions, like transacting in alcohol and so on, which on conventional ethical. bank, on ethical transactions that also conventional economics approves, yeah. which are clearly prohibited in the Quran and Sunnah. But what is important first is the fact that studying haram is itself not haram. There is a difference between this is haram, engaging in haram transaction, you know, uh, executing transactions and businesses that involve har uh, riba, for example. This is one thing. It's different from studying what is riba. Okay. Trying to understand what is riba. In other words, if I may understand you, studying criminology does not equate you to be a criminal. criminal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because okay. somebody studies criminology, exactly. he has not become a criminal. A criminal. You know the because criminal somebody better. wants to become an Islamic scholar. Yes, sir. And as a prerequisite for, underst for becoming an Islamic scholar, of course, you need to understand the perfect Arabic language so that you will understand the Quran and Sunnah. And therefore, in your effort to learn Arabic, then you study the Shi'rul Jahili. Yeah. Where you come across the poems of people like Umrul Qais yeah. with all the immorality and vulgar language exactly. and whatever there. You study all this, you repeat them, you know, not because you believe in it, but you want to understand, you want to use it as a means to understand in Arabic so that you will perfectly understand the Quran and Sunnah because the Quran is Kitab un Arabi, you know, Quran un Arabi. So it doesn't make you a man of Jahiliya who does, who does something that is haram. It's not something you believe in. So riba is haram. There is no doubt about that. The Quran is categorical about it. Alladhina yaakuluna riba la yaqumuna illa kama yaqumu alladhi yatakhabbatuhu shaytanu min almas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who consume riba will not stand on the day of judgment except like he who is beaten by the shaitan with insanity. This is because they equate riba with trade. You know, they say there is no difference. After all, if you give loan on riba, you get a gain, addition. And if you do trade, you also get, a, you know, addition. Allah says, Allah has permitted trade. Waharrama riba and has prohibited riba. So riba is category. There are many verses of the Quran mm. who are very categorical regarding this. A hadith of the Prophet sallallahu cursing anybody who directly or indirectly contributes to riba-based transactions. Mm. This is very clear. But then, as we have said, studying haram might be halal. Studying haram is not in itself haram, and that is why, for Muslims. We know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Marra'a minkum munkaran fal yughayirhu biyadi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very clear about here. And he uses the wisdom of fal yughayirhu. That whoever sees an evil, he should do taghir. He didn't say he should stop it. He says provide alternative. That is provide the ghayr of it. That a better alternative. Now you have seen something which is bad in riba transaction, which conventional economics, conventional banks use. And you want to change it. The first thing for you to even do a judgment regarding riba is to understand it. And of course, that is why our scholars tell us, al hukmu ala shay'i far'un anta sawurihi. That you have to understand something because you can even make a judgment that is proper on it. So, for us to be able to provide alternative, the first thing is for us is to have scholars, to have people who will actually study carefully and understand the workings of the riba-based system. Sure. So, when scholars study and understand it, 
then they will now formulate alternative theories that are sharia based so that we will have sharia based alternatives to riba and that is what we have seen in the muslim world today when conventional banks came to the muslim world during colonialism muslim scholars and jurists and muslim economists looked at it and especially muslim scholars and jurists they realized that this system is useful is very important muslims need a system of financial intermediation using this banking system but the problem is interest riba is the cornerstone of the banking system and therefore they said let us actually critique this system and they continue to write against the riba based transactions that these banks promote but interestingly after they have established that this riba this interest that the church is actually the riba that the quran speaks about other scholars will write like sheikh yusuf al-qardawi will write a book fawaid al-bunuk here riba al-haram bank interest are the actually prohibited riba that the quran has prohibited but then scholars wrote against it gradually now they started to call on muslim economists economics uh, economists and uh, experts. business experts to now formulate alternative theories now through you know a marriage between uh, fake knowledge and economics knowledge our experts and scholars came up with alternative banking system that is sharia compliant and that is why the first set of major contributors to the development of islamic banking are the jurists but then the second were the students of those jurists who were economists if you take scholars like uh, professor umar chapra like professor muhammad najatullah siddiqui who died recently like munzir kaf like mabid al jarhi many of them these were people who went to the us and the uk and studied economics and then after understanding the workings of the economic system they came back and used their knowledge in fact they were also scholars of sharia in their own right some of them and then they used the knowledge of sharia to formulate alternative banking system now uh najatu last siddiqui will write banking without interest you know uh chapra will write towards a just monetary system these scholars wrote this and they will bring the verses of the quran to establish the prohibition of riba and then they will use the fiqh of islam a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to formulate to formulate another alternative way of doing banking today we have islamic banks because our scholars took the time to study banking to understand the workings of riba the workings of haram the workings of that conventional system and then be able to remove what is haram from the banking maintain what is halal and inject sharia based alternatives using murabaha using mudaraba using ijara using salaf using istisna using wakala using many different kafala and many other contracts of sharia which we study in our books of fiqh like for example you know bidayatul uh, you know bidayatul mujtahid and hatul muqtasid and you know all these books if you see you see in this book these are the actually theories if i am used to use the term that have been used these are the teachings and the contracts of the sharia that have been used to provide sharia alternatives so the point is the fact that someone goes to the university to study economics or to study accounting and in accounting they teach compound interest they teach interest it doesn't mean by studying i believe in it that can be used as a means to understanding and providing alternative and mark you this issue of banking is something that has been practiced for yes for decades for centuries now that experience that people have acquired through conventional banking is very very important for us they bring the knowledge they bring the experience of working in the conventional banks so that we now remove what is haram from their knowledge and experience and replace it with what is halal and use it and that is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam teaches us the salam contract that we use the mudaraba contract that we use the ijara contract that we use in islamic banks today were are used also by the people of jahiliya the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not discard them completely he removed what is haram from them 
and then replace that with what is halal and forged ahead to utilize them. So Muslims should go and study economics. Muslims should go and study economics. Muslims should go and study business and other related subjects and become expert in them. But when they go to study, they should do iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. They should study in the name of their law, in ensuring that they are studying these things not to believe in them, not to practice them, but to as a means to understanding how to provide Sharia alternatives to them. And that's what you see even in Nigeria, the people who championed Islamic banking and established the first Islamic financial institution, Lotus Capital, for example, and the first Islamic bank in Nigeria, Jaish Bank. These are people who are well known as experts who have spent decades studying and practicing conventional banking. But then, when they realized they were not comfortable with the un-Islamic nature of the conventional system, they said, okay, how do we now provide Sharia-based alternatives? And they went and attended courses in Islamic finance and then used this to provide alternative, beginning with, you know, uh, fund management in Lotus Capital, for example, to establishing an Islamic bank, Jais Bank. Today we have Jais Bank in Nigeria, having branches in almost all the states of Nigeria. Today we have Taj Bank as a full-fledged Islamic bank, also with a license to operate everywhere in Nigeria. Today we have Lotus Bank that started last year. I mean, just within a year, less than two years, it now has a national license, license to operate. Because Islamic banking is actually a very convenient, very sophisticated, very comfortable alternative. The conventional banking but you can't do it overnight you have to take time to study it and to provide the alternative that is required oh, thank you very much for that uh, lengthy but uh, clear discussion all you were saying or try, all you try to do is to convince us that uh, because there is river or interest base it's not a, sufficient enough to say we should not study them. Yeah. There are other benefits, and through studying them, Muslims have got to have their own alternatives. In other words, Muslims cannot start alternative on dry ground. They need people that have experience from the other system. Yes. After all, it is not everything there that is actually bad. It's a handful of them. Yeah. And some of the facilities you mentioned from the Islamic finance, some are just modifications of what already existed in conventional banks. Yeah. And some were modification of what the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahabas did then. I uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Aisha, I'm still over to you. What would be the duty or responsibility of a Muslim who find himself studying in this kind of course or working in this kind of institutions or even learning or teaching? What would be their duties to the society, particularly in a society bedeviled with high rate of poverty, very low standard of living. What, what exactly should be the rule of Muslims who find themselves in this system as either teaching it or learning or working or are experts in this system? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I think uh, I can say that my brother Amir has actually, in a way, answered the question that you have uh, posed to me. You know him being an expert, a scholar in Islamic economics. So Alhamdulillah, he has made an elaborate explanation. But all the, th the same, uh, I think uh, if there is no alternative Islamic banking in a country, and we know that any country in contemporary world cannot actually develop without this banking system. So if you don't have any viable Islamic alternative. I think scholars are of the opinion that there is concession for Muslim to actually go into it. They can study it and they can also teach it. And as Amir has explained uh, this in length, I think I don't have to explain it further, but uh, uh, there is even, they, they base their argument on that verse of the Quran which says that if you take it out of necessity, then there is no problem with that, at least for, for the time being. And that actually was what happened 
in the olden days in Nigeria and other countries. At that time, there was no Islamic banking, and therefore our scholars at that time issued a fatwa that people could actually partake in the conventional banking system, and that was what actually happened. But the later we see that with the emergence of Islamic banking, people are now gradually and gradually going back, going to the Islamic uh, banking system. And then again, um, scholars also feel that if there is the feeling of being marginalized in a country, like in Nigeria today, where we have, I can say, a secular, where Muslims and non-Muslims are living together with about 50-50, according to some, some a, a slight difference between yeah. the Muslims and the Christians. And our economic system is not based on Islam. It is based, so to speak, on secular uh, policies. Yeah. Now, if there is this fear of marginalization, that if the Muslims do not actually partake in this kind of activities, probably the Muslims are going to be, to be marginalized. So economically. that o economically, yeah. the, ec the economic policies Muslims will not know about, they will, they will not partake yeah. in the policies that are being made. So scholars are of the view that Muslims have also participate in such kind of uh, activities. So, but then, whatever may be the case, our priority is that even wherever we are, even if we uh, participate in this kind of things, we should also we should always bear in mind that we are there so that we can be able to bring about change so that we can be able to change or to at least help in finding policies that will change the conventional banking to an islamic banking so therefore that is important put it in our minds that that is our own um what we should do and then also we should also bear in mind that Whenever we are in this kind of conventional things, that is whether the banking or whatever, we are there as ambassadors of Muslims. Therefore, anything that will help towards the development of Muslims, we should try to see that we, we assist towards that. For, for instance, when there is the issue of uh, poverty alleviation programs that are being given by, by, by the federal government, for instance, Muslims in the conventional banking should be there that will be helping other Muslims and we should try as much as possible to enlighten our Muslim population that even if they do not accept this uh, assistance, then definitely the other people of the country will go and assist uh, and, and partake in this and therefore we should, we should be left aside. The, the probably the much assistance need, uh, the, more, the much needed assistance, especially for our brothers and, uh, and uh, sisters that are uh, in the rural areas who are slightly poor, that assistance may be of help with, uh, to them. But then if we do not, we said it is haram, therefore we are not going to accept it, it will be a minus to us. Therefore it is important that our people in such kind of uh, situation should be helped by the people that are in that particular uh, profession. And then as Amir has been saying, we are there, it is important that our Muslim brothers and sisters go and learn such kind of things so that they will bring the change. It is only when you are in a higher position that you can be able to use the position you are in to see what you can help, what you can provide Muslims with. As an example, there are so many, but of importance is Muhammadu Sunusulaymi, uh, the 14th Emir of Kano. We know that he was a central, a governor of a central bank. And it was during his tenure that even the issue of um, Islamic banking came into being. It was during his time that a board, or was it a board of trust? Sharia advisory board. Yeah, was established so that people can find a way of actually trying to uh, establish this Islamic banking. So if not to say that he's, he, uh, he has been in that, he had been in that capacity, probably we wouldn't have the opportunity to help. So therefore, actually, uh, taking <coughs> these courses and then partaking in them and being part of it is just as, uh, as, a daru as a darura, which I think it is permissible that people, as long as we don't have viable Islamic alternatives, then people can partake in it, especially with the, with the idea that 
maybe probably they will read through it they will understand what it takes they will understand how the river works how other non-islamic um, components works and how they will try to find an alternative to such things mm -hmm. i think finally what is important is that we are there every muslim should know that we are there all muslims are there to serve as uh, to propagate what is right and to try and, and avoid what is wrong so therefore the muslims that are in that conventional system may not be may not believe in in it studying as he has said is one thing and believing in, in it is uh, is another thing but it is important that we partake in that so that we can be able to find viable islamic alternatives to such things uh, thank well, you very uh, much for that uh, in other words we cannot shy away from it because it is a necessity and it affects all of us and it is better to be part and light a candle than to be outside mm -hmm. uh thank you very much uh amir abdullahi let's still come back to you thank you uh could study in economics accounting and banking as you elaborated earlier looking at our reality now become a necessity or social obligation now for muslims uh as far as i'm concerned uh within my little understanding of the teachers of islam you see there are subjects and courses the studying of which is no doubt a social obligation a communal you know responsibility that at least muslims necessarily need to have certain number of qualified experts in them of course usually people talk about medicine and agriculture but economics accounting no society can live without the economy uh, uh look at the quran how he attaches importance to wealth look at how preservation you know wealth creation wealth distribution wealth you know preservation wealth enhancement is part of the overall objectives you know the universal objectives of the sharia you know hifdhul mal so you can see how wealth is important the quran you know is categorical calling wealth you know malakum allati ja'ala allah lakum qiyaman that is the you know uh, backbone of exactly. the life you know exactly. and so on and so forth it is called fadlullah allah's bounty so anything related to studying how to create wealth how to preserve wealth how to you know and distribute wealth and enhance wealth in the society of course mastering that is an obligation there must be a certain number of muslims enough sufficient enough to master this area so that muslims will not be dependent upon others in their economic life and we can see that from the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated to medina the first thing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did was to establish a masjid that was first but we always talk about this one without looking at okay what was the second the second thing the second major project of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was to establish a market for the muslims yeah. you know the jews had their own market and uh, muslims were actually you know uh, uh, short changed in the market and yeah. uh, and uh, it was unfavorable for for their economic activities and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went looked for a very convenient place and established a market and he say hada sukukum this is your own market also muslim so in other words muslims should be independent economically so if we don't have ec economists we don't have accountants we don't have business experts who would be the central bank governor that will now you know change the policies to suit sharia as uh, Khalifa Muhammad Sanusi did to be in line with our values to be in la to be in line with the values of the sharia that we pro mm. we propagate and we we live with if we don't have muslims who study accounting do we agree that all the accountant generals accountants general of the federation should be non muslims and therefore the economy i mean uh, is controlled by them if we don't have experts in economics and finance do we accept that all the banks in in our own country should be owned and controlled by non muslims i hope it's clear so we should not have banks we should not master the workings of the economy of the country and therefore we should continue to be the servants of others of course 
Muslims need to go and do it and therefore it becomes a social obligation for Muslims to go and study it and they at least at least uh, even if there are things that are taught in economics and finance that are not in tandem with the teachings of the Sharia it is part of the darura that Muslims have to undergo that training so that they will as a step to remove that uh, system that is on Islamic and change it for the betterment of their own life it's okay I thank you very much and uh, just to crown up the subject of uh, Islamic finance uh, prof what what would you say regarding those who still believe that working in this kind of conventional institution uh, financial institutions or Islamic uh, non-islamic based banking now the riba based banking and what have you that that is tantamount to disbelief or kufr like what is the justification for that assertion actually there are some scholars but actually there are very few who believe that working the riba in banks are not regarded as the prohibited riba in, in quran but as i have said earlier there are very few okay. majority of the scholars are of the view that that riba in the banks are is the same riba that is being prohibited in the quran mm. but even if that is the case as we have been earlier been saying we have been saying it that if there is no alternative viable alternate islamic alternative then a person can go for that no but then that does not mean that he can just go there stretch his leg believe in it and continue enjoying it we have been saying that that should be as a darura and then after me in the rura if he and then he should also study what is there so that he can be able to drink change for that in other words but, being there is to walk their way out of it yeah okay. but then even then working there is not tantamount to kufr while a person can go there continue working there it does not mean that he has become a kafir as far as the ahli sunnah are concerned any crime that is any ethn that is done does not bring a person out of the folds of islam no. that is the ideology of the ahli sunnah no. you have sinned but you have not become a kafir that ideology is uh, according to the khawari the khawari are of the opinion that any ethn that you have done you are completely a disbeliever but the ahli sunnah who are of the majority believe that whatever sin you do is between you and Allah and you have not become a kafir and therefore uh, studying that oh, does not bring a person does not uh, bring a person out of the fold of Islam just because you are there uh, as a worker or as whatever you are not out of the fold of Islam so I, I think I, I, I let me also uh, add something about this you see uh, there are uh, things that are clearly prohibited in the Sharia. Riba is one of them. Of course, regarding some of the details of riba, scholars differ. There is no any difference among scholars regarding the prohibition of riba. Mm. But there are differences regarding whether a certain type of transaction yeah, from actually is riba or not. Mm. Uh, but bank interest today. Uh, virtually you can say it, 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 it is almost becoming like a consensus of the qualified juries uh, and, and of course all fatwa councils in the world that bank interest is riba. Earlier some scholars actually because maybe they didn't uh, properly understand the workings of that riba. That is one point. Now it is haram but someone partakes in riba and you ask him why do you do this he says wallahi is because you know do you know it is haram he says yes i know it is haram but you know if the person accepts the haramability of this thing that it is haram prohibition. the prohibition of this thing but he commits it then what he is doing is he is committing a sin he is not a kafir he is not mm, committing mm. an act of kufr disbelief mm. a person who is compelled by necessity to do it his hukum is different there is the ruling of his act is different from someone who deliberately without any reason chooses to do it even though he doesn't i mean he, he accepts that it is haram he doesn't legalize it, he doesn't legalize it. Oh. so he is doing that because he doesn't have an alternative hmm. 
his ruling is different. Yeah. Uh, so th- depending upon his own reason, if it is the ruler that takes him to that, then he's mm. not committing a sin, he's doing halal. Mm. If it is haja also, it can be considered as halal. Mm. But a person who does it, but knows that, I mean, uh, he knows the Sharia positions, but he still says he doesn't believe in the Sharia position. That no, he knows, he says it is not even haram. Something that is clearly prohibited by the Quran and Sunnah. Yet he actually rejects the Quranic and Sunnah, the Sunnah's position, and he says it is halal. In other words, he permits what Allah has prohibited. Mm. Then in that regard, that is an act of kufr. So long as the person is doing that out of clear knowledge that that is haram, yet he says it is not haram. So despite, I mean, in, uh, despite the fact that also he doesn't have any other sharia acceptable excuse for that, any ta'awil for that. If it is clear for him, yet he rejects it, then it becomes kufr. So actually, uh, the fact that someone therefore is working with the bank, even though the bank operates based on interest, is not just the reason to take him to kufr. That one is not even kufr. Mm-hmm. But then someone, unless if he permits the haram in it. Now, someone who goes there, because he has no any alternative. He doesn't have any alternative. And he has to eat, he has to drink. Mm. Then that one you can not say it is he's also doing haram. He is doing something based on the rura. But then the rura, to qaddaru bi qadariha, to the mm. extent that he has that need, he can work with that. But remind you also, there are people who work with the banks. They know it is haram. And they may have an alternative. Mm-hmm. But they have the intention of mastering the workings of the system so that they want gradually, inshallah, to provide Sharia alternative by establishing Islamic microfinance banks, at least at their own level, or fund management institutions that will serve gradually as a Sharia compliant alternative for their people. That intention is very, very important, you know, uh, because intention changes the hukum of something. Mm. You know, so I think it's important for people to understand all these details in the Sharia. It's not just because something is declared prohibited that you once will say, what, whoever, but for whatever reason, in whatever circumstance and situation, whoever does it, then you even, there is not even the question of kufr in just participating in it. But the, 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 the issue of kufr arises when someone rejects clear prohibition. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I think just to add, it's not just in Islamic finance. Muslim experts have been working in various areas to ensure that whatever has not been in line with our ethics are corrected. And that's why you have halal industry. In entertainment, they've been trying to modify it. In hotels, in food, in pharmaceuticals, Mm -hmm. and various areas. Mm -hmm. Whatever Muslims find that this is not in line with our ethics, Muslims have been proactive. Have been uh, doing fal yugayirhu. Fal yugayirhu. And this is, I think, what is most important. Uh, but we can't be excluded out of it. That uh, will not be good for us uh, in all situations. But uh, let's be part of it. Uh, so that it's possible those that design it did not deliberately want to exclude us. But they don't know our values. Yes. If we are not there to tell uh, them, uh, I think that's it. Because I don't want to believe like in Nigeria that the non-Muslims and the conventional banking owners in quote and what have you okay. really don't like the non-interest no they don't know it oh. when some of them are getting to know it they even embrace it much more than us so uh, thank you very much for this uh, discussion and last one out Allah reward you and continue to increase your knowledge our, our viewers this is why you come to the end of this episode see you in the next episode Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>